Why don't we just go around the horn just for folks who uh, uh, entered in the last few minutes, starting with um, David Hayes, Deputy of Interior. David. David Hayes, Deputy of Interior. <laughs> Hayes, Deputy of Interior. Um, who else is new? Roger. Roger Baker, uh, Secretary of DA. Stephen. Stephen Hanrobel, I'm the uh, Federal Chief Information Officer. Casey Coleman, GSA. Everybody else is a veteran. All right. We haven't changed yet. Should we do it again? <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over is it to, to Stephen, right, to, um, to navigate us through the next uh, 40 or 45 minutes or so, I believe starting on page 14. It's page one on the deck I have in front of me. So it's I'm federal sure, CIO sure it overview. I should say federal CIO overview, I believe, on the top. And while Steve is doing that, Andrew, you want to Jackson, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Technology and Interior. Great. So I, I won't take a lot of the time here today, given that uh, we have some very esteemed guests I think, to, to uh, present uh, some of the results of the work that we've done on vendor management organizations and investment review boards. I think the the, the bottom line takeaway for us is that we've had some incredibly positive results and we've instituted some systems, one of which I'm going to announce today, that we're scaling government-wide to address some of the feedback and some of the things we learned. And I, um, I personally did some of the site visits and it was very, very valuable to not only reinforce, I think, uh, some of the best practices that all of you uh, are doing in your organizations, but also the applicability of those uh, of those things to government. You know, we have some some loosely knit vendor management efforts within government that we were we were sort of driving for and doing centralization. We had investment review boards, but they were largely budget scrub exercises, not strategic exercises. Um, and we had some challenges in the way that government was organized and, and uh, the authorities that, that chief information officers and other executive teams getting together had to oversee the work of their agency. And so we've done a lot to address those. And hopefully you hear about some of those. Um, and I want to thank you for all the, all the uh, willingness to work with us on this. A couple of the highlights on the next slide uh, is, is one um, on VMOs. Uh, one of the things we've done working very closely with your, uh, your companies is um, created a maturity model to help uh, agencies understand sort of where they were and the steps it necessary to sort of climb up the ladder to get to the, get to the upper rungs of a, of a solid uh, maturity model inside the organization. And, and uh, this is already starting to identify gaps for us and where we need to, uh, where, where these agencies need to go to get there. The other thing is, is, uh, is your teams were invaluable helping us develop scorecards for people on looking kind of at the objective level and working our way back from that. What are, what are the things we want to accomplish and how do we get there and how do we measure success on this stuff uh, in the VMO side. On investment review board, um, we had some, the, the big thing that we, uh, that we drove out of that beyond just creating a new culture within these agencies around what the role of the investment review board is as a strategic tool versus sort of just a budget tool, um, is uh, today we're launching uh, something we call portfolio stat which is a new effort to, to gather data across agencies, um, the whole of agencies, to uh, look in the, in the dark corners of agencies to figure out what is being spent, where is it being spent, and assess at the portfolio level what's going on. A lot of the challenges we had in a lot of these very, very large agencies, you know, you'll have agencies with hundreds of thousands of, of employees where uh, the CIO at the top of the org chart doesn't have authority to actually control uh, investment at the at the lower rungs. Um, I know some CIOs that tell me they had more power when they were a, a branch CIO than than and than they are now at the head CIO of the agency. And so, uh, uh, Jeff and the director's uh, office, we we uh, put out a uh, uh, um, we we, uh, we put out a, a, C, a CIO authorities memo to basically guide agencies into creating more accountability and authority. Uh, and this tool portfolio stat is now a way that OMB. Uh, and our office can go and drive uh, cross-government uh, accountability on this stuff and start to really programmatize um, investment review boards. So we're, we're proud to be launching that today, and that's going to that's gonna happen now to impact uh, our next cycle of budget, uh, which, is, uh, which is the key, key ingredient of how to get there. Um, so you've heard enough from me. Let's transition on the next slide to actually going in and hearing from the agencies that, that have done these pilots. 
um, and we're actively scaling these uh, these uh, across the board. We're going to start talking about IT vendor management offices. Um, and Dave Capos uh, from Patent and Trademark is going to start us off. Uh, Roger's going second from from VA, and then Casey uh, to my left um, from GSA. Then we'll we'll kind of open it up to get some questions uh, laid out to you on kind of our next steps. Uh, and then we'll come back and talk about uh, portfolio management and uh, investment review boards and do the same thing there. So with that, Dave. Okay, thanks, Steve. So um, for PTO, we're uh, on an annual IT spend of circa $400 million or so as a sort of a baseline. We have uh, made, we feel, tremendous progress with the um, VMO uh, process. We do have some you know, next steps I'll talk about in just a second. In terms of the uh, where we are today and, and what we've managed to accomplish, we have fully centralized our uh, purchasing, um, and that has in, indeed unlocked the promise of VMO by shining a bright light, enabling collection of metrics and metrics-based um, uh, processing of our IT-related spend. A uh, number of great lessons learned from our visit to Aetna uh, a while ago, and we are still in the process of applying those. One of them is sort of where government IT um, and government budget planning meets the private sector, and it's been fascinating to me um, to see the long time cycles that government uses to plan, right? And so this point about one-year budget planning um, that we've figured out now through VMO how to include a portfolio management view, despite the fact that, that we have to plan our uh, IT spend on a multi-year basis and years in advance, has been enormously helpful um, and has, to us, uh, you know, unlocked the ability to merge a government need for multi-year planning cycle with the reality of the fact that you you can't really know everything you're going to need to do IT-wise two and three and, and more years in advance. So that's been, to us, a really good experience that came out of Aetna. Second major experience out of Aetna is linking the VMO program with our project management office that has led us to be able to um, get what we need only when we need it and not sooner than when we need it. There's a, at least there's been a problem historically at PTO we wind up ordering things, and the vendors ship them very fast. Frequently, we get them, and they sit. In some cases, IT equipment sitting for months, maybe a year, maybe longer than a year, which is absolutely bizarre, right, from a private sector viewpoint. So we, through this process, we have managed to stop all of that and get to, through VMO to a just-in-time kind of procurement model. So the last thing I'll mention relative to the, the Aetna experience is um, you know, what I call the, well, the one neck to squeeze um, principle, having a single executive that is, uh, that is identifiably responsible for our entire IT portfolio. I mean, I think this is kind of what Steve was saying, but being able to, to get to where you can find the person in whom responsibility vests and, um, and well, have some accountability, but also give them the tools and, 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 and the, the things, the handles they need to be able to do a good job. So um, that has been a tremendous experience for us. The one other thing I'll say uh, before moving on is that um, the uh, ability to modify contracts in order to track efficiencies um, through, through time and by individual has also been transformative for us. It's changed us from an approach, that, you know, our old approach, which is where bills came in and they said things like, you know, we did something for a month and here's how much you owe us, which is very, very difficult to then pry open and figure out how you audit it, how you assure that the work was done, you got value for it. Now, with the VMO process, we literally know what every person on that contract did every day, you know, even down to the hour. So we can tell the activity they were working on and the pro productivity we got from it. And it makes me feel, and our CIO here, feel much more confident about the value we're getting for our spend um, uh, over time. So, uh, Steve, I had, I think. You want to keep going on one or, one or two other things here, right? right. Okay, so um, that brings us to outcomes to date, right? Uh, we are actually making really substantial financial progress, which is what gets me quite interested. So 
we reduced our spending on COTS software, $1.8 million. That's a per year number. Uh, but much more significantly, we've redu reduced maintenance costs um, uh, to the tune of $52 million a year. We were, you know, when we started, we were just blowing money at this agency, just pouring money um, into, into maintenance that, in, that prevented us from doing the upgrading work we needed to do. So we've got now, we got more to do, but we made substantial progress there. Um, now, in terms of next steps, um, I so absolutely. You just skipped over this notion, which I found interesting, which is leverage across the other departments with commerce. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so. I think that's, that's what we'd love, love to see I, a lot. I was about yeah. to nudge him okay. on that one. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's one of the great things is the more leverage. Yeah, so we now have the ability through common contracts, right, to act as a resource and coordinate with our parent agency and obtain much better leverage, much better prices. Right. I, think, I think that's part of I think that's the question that becomes how far can you take that? Mm -hmm. Across the government. Sorry? Across the government. Yeah, how far yeah. can you take that? Well, I mean, ultimately, you want to be able to do it across the whole federal government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, next steps. We've got a lot more to do. Hold that thought. It's one of our <clears throat> topic selection okay. potentials for later. So we, we love the PMAB specified, and I think this is what Steve was referring to before, that we've got real metrics now that we can aim for. 40% PMAB specified um, uh, level of maintenance as a percentage of our total IT spend. We started at PTO at 84%. We're now at 68%, so we're on the path. We've got more work to do. It's absolutely great that we've got something clear to aim for. We do have a bit of a conundrum in the government in that, as I understand it, um, we measure some things in maintenance in, in maintenance spend that you might not measure as maintenance spend in the private sector, including call center overhead, things like that. Uh, so there may be some normalization to do, but it, to me it's absolutely wonderful that we've got a continuous path and a goal to aim for. Uh, focus on data analysis will obviously continue uh, to optimize contract spending. The use of data analysis, right, you know, having data, as I already mentioned, is absolutely key to being able to improve efficiency, and um, we need to continue working on that in order to find places where we can replace what the current task orders that we're using, current vendor work we're doing, with, um, well, frankly, less expensive, more effective alternatives. So one example is call center outsourcing. We're currently working on that as USPTO. We can only start to see that as an opportunity when we got onto the VMO track and began to really understand where we were um, spending our money. So um, last thing I'll say under next steps is that we will be working on continuing to enhance um, customer visibility into our, uh, our, our contracts. Now we've got a situation where we move from, frankly, a, a, a distrust within our own agency where um, our, in our case, our patents function didn't work well with our trademarks function and they all distrusted each other and they thought that they were working in a zero-sum world. Well, now everybody gets to see, right, the IT spend. It's totally transparent, nothing's hidden, nothing um, is concealed, and it's enabled our CIO function to move to a world of trust because nobody feels like they're being sandbagged. And I think that has been um, transformative for us. We're going to continue to invest in that transparency, just internal transparency. David, can I ask a question as a, uh, as a customer, an out external customer of the Patent Office? Do you have, uh, do you find that the applicants for uh, patents and trademarks are uh, an enabler, a barrier, uh, or neutral to the uh, uh, improvement of the IT function within the office? Mostly an enabler. Uh, mostly they, they see the agency gaining through increased IT efficiency as a net benefit for them because we speed up, we get a bit more accuracy, turn information to them in a form that they can use it better. So I think about 75% an enabler. The place where it gets interesting is when you talk about a change to our IT systems that might require them to change what they're doing. Right. And then you get into you know very detailed discussions about how much is it going to cost us? Are you going to force us to move to some system that we don't want to use? Those kinds of discussions. This is phenomenal progress. Yeah. Just the cultural shift alone must have been 
amazing for you all. Yeah, it has been a great piece of work, and, and the credit really goes to my CIO, Don Holmes, who's sitting right behind me over here. That's great. This is a well, success story actually, writ large, big. the PT, PTO. Yeah. Um, turnaround that Dave and his team have done. They've really made a huge, it's one of the best success stories in this administration in terms of turning around a whole culture and operation and, you know, in an area that's impactful on jobs and competitiveness. They like it now. <laughs> I guess it all comes down to this net thing. I never heard of that before. But the neck, <laughs> yeah. Breathe when you said What's that? Now I know why they call us pencil neck geeks because. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to be quite a job that uh, Aetna, we would refer to that as a single point of accountability. <laughs> <laughs> but we know what you mean. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so you're on slide, what number slide are we on? Uh, we are on slide uh, 19. 19. Uh, I greatly enjoyed that. There are a lot of similarities uh, between patent and trademark and VA. Uh, centralized IT, I think, is critical to both of them. Uh, VA is writ a bit large from that. It's a $3.5 billion IT budget. All of the IT spend is centralized under the, under the CIO, so there's the authority to, to do things. I'm sorry, I think what much, you're going to hear is how much did you say? 3.5 billion per year. Yeah. Um, I think what you're going to hear from this is why we need to be doing the portfolio stats that uh, uh, that Steve is moving forward, because I feel like we're a little bit ahead because of our centralized nature in doing those things. When you pull that whole portfolio together and you look at it you start to see the kind of results that you're seeing out of patent and trademark, and, and I'll tell you about here in a minute from VA. So specific to, uh, to the VMO, we have a VMO stood up. We have uh, several staff, I'm trying to think about whether it's four or five, in the VMO. To me, most critical is we recognize we needed to join what uh, we termed our ruthless reduction task force with the VMO. Looking at all of our spend with a critical eye for is this the best use of the dollars in here? Um, we have gone out and established our contracts database, understand everybody we're doing business with, and most importantly, where are we doing business with each of them multiple places. Um, and we've, we've moved forward with a balanced scorecard view of that. Um, if I had three charts, the balanced scorecard would be the third one, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, but you've all seen balanced scorecard pieces. So let me talk, about, talk a little bit about results. Um, Did you go on all four of these uh, visits? All four site visits? Uh, my folks did. I, That's great. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we've taken a long, hard look at our enterprise licenses software. Um, I didn't include the number in here because it would have been preliminary until this morning, but we will save about $100 million a year in just this category wow. from right-sizing our enterprise licenses. Um, we, um, we looked at standardizing the processes for vendor management, as we talked about the database of, uh, of IT vendors. We've, we've looked at things like print management. And for an organization the scale of VA, we're the second largest federal department. Um, as we look at moving from personal printers to network printers, the cost per page of printing on a personal printer versus on a network printer is about four and a half times more. Very convenient, small dollars when you're not talking about billions of pages. But for us, as we look at each one of our major facilities, and we've got about 200 of them, the pilots say we'll save a million dollars every three years or less. So what, uh, from, from a time scale. You then do that times 200 facilities, and you're looking at a pretty significant amount of money. Um, you know, the anecdote I give our doctors is, look, you've been telling me to take a walk for a long period of time. Just take a little walk over the next <laughs> um, <laughs> It seems to work. Um, the, the nuance here is that the bulk of the savings do not go into my budget. Toner cartridges in our budget are bought by the, the local administration, the local hospital. So the bulk of the savings go into the health appropriation and the benefits appropriation, not into the IT appropriation. But I have the ability to write the policy that then drives uh, this approach to things. 
we have on our board, there, we have in our Ruthless Reduction Task Force about 25 things along these lines. The single CPU policy, the consolidation of mobile telephone you know, contracts for services. Um, not all of them are going to show the $100 million for enterprise licenses or $200 million for printing, but they're all the same sort of thing that your private sector, you'd expect your private sector CIOs to be doing for your budget. And in a consolidated appropriation, you start to see CIOs that look at it that way. That's what the portfolio stack will start to do when you start looking at the distributed ones that way. Um, another one we've got, and this is probably a better example of the kind of things we'll see, power savings. Every desktop computer in VA, 360,000 of them, goes to sleep at about 7 o'clock at night and wakes up about 7 o'clock the next morning. If you figure 12 and a half cents per megawatt hour or per, per kilowatt hour for power by that number of, uh, of desktops, that's $24 million a year in completely useless electrical that's, that's now not being burnt. We move uh, from, I think it's 110 kilowatt or, uh, watts per hour to three watts per hour by putting them to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, again, because we can see every desktop in that network, we can then put the software on and apply the policies to, to do that kind of stuff. Um, the one CPU policy um, will save us some buys. Moving to cloud email, um, you know, will we'll have a lot of uh, benefits for us. Something that your folks have probably done are probably a long ways ahead of us is virtualization of servers. This is one of those things that as a private sector CIO, you say, well, that was so year 2000. Um, we're 25% of the way there right now in the VA and moving hard to do a lot more virtualization. <coughs> Um, we talked about software license management, and uh, it's interesting as you look at enterprise licenses, because in some cases you want to move toward them, and in some cases you want to move away from them. So that's why the analysis is really critical, is to understand which ones you want to, and, and I'd use the phrase right-sizing, you know, across all those things. Exactly how do you want to handle enterprise licenses. And then, of course, it's all about um, early detection of underperforming money, I, I think, in the end. Um, whether it's a contract, whether it's hardware. You know, hardware sitting in boxes is one of the banes of my existence. Um, you know, at, at our scale, it's very difficult to keep track of that sort of stuff. So it's just tightening down the screws and making better use of the dollars. That's a great report. Okay. Uh, the General Services Administration is probably closer in scale to the Patent and Trade Office than the Veterans Administration. We're a, an agency of 17,000 people, and our annual IT budget is somewhere just uh, just north of 600 million. So, um, in our in our organization, commodity IT has all been centralized. The business systems remain uh, decentralized under the component organizations. Uh, but there is a, a real good progress on vendor management as a way for us to operate more effectively at an enterprise level, even though our IT is not centralized like VA's is. So I look at this as an enabling mechanism, a pull mechanism to, to bring us along. We have um, some early results to talk about. We've identified the, the team that will form the vendor management office. And for the most part, those are folks on the ground in my office. We're going to use some key vacancies to flesh that team out. We've put, um, like PTO, we've put the vendor management and a program management office together so we can better manage throughout the entire life cycle of our IT uh, programs so that there's a, a single senior executive point of accountability, um, one throat to choke, managing the entire life cycle from a, from a procurement and deployment point of view. Um, now, the, the, the vendor management office has a companion team in the contracting organization, and we've We've staffed that up. We've added additional contracting officers, which, as you know, are, are really the gatekeepers in the federal government to make things happen. So we've got a very talented, fully staffed team there. Um, in terms of commodity IT, we're now linking that commodity IT function, which is over five years about $250 million, so it's a significant spend for us, uh, to the vendor management office so that the VMO will be responsible for managing that contract and overseeing its progress and managing that vendor team, making sure that um, at, at the project level we're getting the right kind of uh, staff and that we're not overpaying for those skills. Uh, we have created an inventory of IT spending across GSA, which is just invaluable in terms of the visibility and the transparency. So, so even though it's not centralized, we know where the dollars are going. 
and that has identified opportunities for enterprise negotiations and, and to give us the ability to act more as an enterprise, leverage the buying power that we have as an agency, and I think partner with other agencies that are doing the same thing with the same vendors. Uh, we're continuing to move solutions to the cloud. As we get better transparency about where our systems sit, how much we're paying for them, and what architecture they're on, we can identify the opportunities to move to the cloud and gain the agility and cost savings that cloud offers. Uh, uh, we, you, uh, have, we've moved several systems to cloud-based solutions already. The most recent one that we're uh, here speaking about today is our IT service desk, which we're going to move to the cloud. And I'll talk in a minute about the savings that allows us to forego a very expensive upgrade to our in-house system and uh, uh, avoid $3 million in cost uh, to, do, to do that upgrade. We, uh, th we participated in the Aetna visit and thought that was extremely helpful. Um, they focused a lot on benchmarking, on really understanding where they stand against their peer organizations and using that as a forcing mechanism. I think they benchmark multiple times a year to, to stay on top of where they are in their industry. And we've uh, since gone and uh, conducted a study. We, uh, we engaged Gartner to give us a benchmark of where we stand against our peers in the federal government as well as like organizations in private sector and identified a lot of opportunities there for us to take, take our progress further. Next slide, um, slide 22, outcomes to date. I've already mentioned that by moving our IT service desk to the cloud, we will avoid the need uh, later this year to have gone through a costly in-house upgrade that would have cost $3 million. Uh, the service desk deployment is somewhere um, in several hundred thousand dollars, so there's a significant cost savings right off, off the bat. Because we have an inventory of our IT spending, we've been able to identify where we have um, uh, licenses that were not being used. And so we've cut software maintenance for those unnecessary software licenses. And uh, that's a cost, that's an actual hard dollar cost savings of over a million dollars annually. Uh, this ability into IT spending has given us other areas where we're going to be moving to the cloud, uh, including areas such as uh, collaboration and internal uh, networking. Social networking, not, not uh, uh, telecommunications networking. Uh, expected results going forward, um, our infrastructure benchmark, the Gartner study that we, um, uh, it was the brainstorm as a result of the Aetna visit, uh, has highlighted areas for future consolidation and cost savings. We're going to be um, repeating that, I think, on an, at least an annual basis, perhaps biannually. Um, like uh, VA, we're implementing uh, printer, uh, printer management uh, through the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative. And uh, I didn't know that number four and a half times. I'm going to use that. but. Um, we have been slowly moving away from personal printers, but we still have a significant fleet of those. We probably have twice as many personal printers as we do uh, multifunction print copy machines. So by going through a, a strategic sourcing initiative, that'll reduce our reliance on these personal printers and uh, uh, reduce our footprint, our carbon footprint, and save money. Uh, in terms of mission outcomes, we anticipate that vendor management is really going to let us manage our industry partners on a, on a much more projectized basis. Previously, we were managing sort of at a high-level contract, you know, against the overall consumption against that contract. But I think now we'll be able to hold them accountable at a project level for much more rapid uh, incremental development of capabilities. So we're not uh, spending millions of dollars and hoping in two or three years something good happens. It will be much more in the, you know, six weeks to three month time frame to see capabilities start to be uh, deployed. And I think that's the end of mine. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, and let's join, uh, get the conversation going here. Uh, mindful of we probably in seven, eight, ten minutes to shift to a quick run on the investment board. Uh, any comments or general comments or anything progress. before we dive into yeah, some good questions? Progress. Really good yeah. progress. I think we're, we're, we're very pleased with what's what's going on. And the, the next step, of course, is just deploying, scaling this exactly. uh, government-wide. And I think as we all sit down and sort of think about how that manifests itself, you know, culture is often the, the barrier we face the most. Um, and I think you'll notice in some of the questions you see on slide 23, often the undertone of all of these is sort of culture. And so we may, we may think about asking, you know, asking you about culture in our, uh, what we'll now call our one next strategy here. Um, uh, the, fir the first question I think is a, is a relevant one. It's really about kind of as you think about that one neck person or the leader of this team or things, what the attributes we should be looking for in staffing? Is, is it 
is the leader of this team a person who's a deal maker, is able to go out and shake up the vendor community? Is it a, uh, a consolidator, consensus person? Is it a, is it a person that's, that's more of kind of an intermediary or a numbers cruncher? Or? So there's two different, there's, two, there's various roles. One is the leader and the other is the people who work on specific categories. And I think you need category expertise. I, I, I focus, the leader is interesting, but I think you need the category expertise if you go into telecommunications or any other types of systems. People who have that experience really understand how telecommunications works. They will absolutely get better outcomes. So you need subject matter experts in the categories. How much can you augment that with, um, with organizations like Gartner? I mean, part of it is looking at the market, and part of it is really knowing. Uh, I think Gartner will give you good benchmark data, as Casey was saying. I think what you really have to focus on, though, is People who understand the cost structure of the telecommunications industry will always get you better deals. Will get you better outcomes. I guarantee it. And that, I'm just using, I'm not picking on telco. I'm just saying that's an example. I think software is a category. You probably need people who have real good knowledge of the software category. Part of our challenge in government is the is the fiefdom nature of agencies. When you get into small agencies, their ability to staff up expertise in those ways is a challenge. And so I think one of our things is to think about. How do we centralize some of these functions exactly. across government to, to get that? Well, that's why I like the leverage that David was talking about with the broader commerce, because that's where you can get the expert that gets better leverage. And so the question will come down to where is the VMO, at what level inside of a department is the VMO? Right. What's the mechanism? Uh, We're at the corporate level. What's the mechanism between the three groups that are currently piloting it to get share best practices or get that or kind of speak as one voice? How do you guys interact? My understanding is that there is a, uh, a group of folks that are doing this fairly <laughs> regularly to talk about what's Across these agents. Across the agents, that's right. We've actually expanded it to the entire CIO council. So we have a, a council of an executive council and a broader council, and one of our subcommittees there is actually taking this on to look at how do we look at specific cate categories of, of um of work. Because to Enrique's point, you don't want to solve it one software expert at a time. You don't need triple the amount of staffing. Right. To I think our real, you know, we had a realization. We did a, a, a CIO offsite, and uh, and I think Roger was sitting down with the CIO of the Army, and they realized with a specific vendor that Army actually wasn't getting a better price than he was, and and his orders of magnitude larger. And so yeah. so that sort of realization made us really wake up and the, say, the, we've got to do a consolidated effort. Here. Sorry, Steve. The other, the other comment I would give you that's important here is people are going to get motivated by the savings they drive. Like every time each of you spoke, you talked about it, we saved X amount. So publishing that and making the VMO really see that success and then that getting translated to the rest of the organization to see what this group is contributing will make them heroes. And so that's what, what you want. And we highlight that when somebody comes through and saves us you know, a pretty significant amount of money, we know who that person is. I mean, even at my staff level. And that, that kind of visibility will get those people motivated. I can't resist making sure I put this out, though. There is a downside from pointing out your savings in the federal government. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over the, last, over the last two years, I've lost $363 million because I saved it. So, you know, there is a sanity question amongst CIOs yeah. to, you know, if, if you're going to save it, how do you hide it? Um, <laughs> And, and, I, and I hate to admit that, you would not look at that in the private sector. But that is a reality in the government. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I guess the question is when you're saving it in printer costs or you know, utility costs, um, you know, specifically electricity, it, it really wasn't yours to begin with. I mean, do you, do you know what I mean? Like you're, it's other people's money that Absolutely. most of these initiatives are. So is the, the morning of saving it because your budget feels smaller, so you've... You no, know. The, the, the issue is that uh, we all have uh, unfunded requirements that we're not able to get to, things right. that we know we need to do. So if you save $24 million in printer costs, doesn't that give you $24 million to do, or it's just taken away? Hey, I, gotta, I gotta jump in here. In this, in today's environment, 
we're much better off getting the $24 million savings. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And we have a much better shot of funding other all, other yeah. priorities. If we get those savings, yeah. at least we have a shot of funding them. Without those savings, you got no shot of funding. Right. So yeah, exactly. My, my observation that, was simply about the dynamic. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have leaders here who are doing that. Roger's right, you don't necessarily get to then invest it in another priority. But if we don't save the money, we have no opportunity. And we're, you know, in a very... All your priorities are met. You have a big overture on your budget. I think we'd all agree. Yeah. So those things that never get funded, it's there's almost the law of nature. Right. But it, it's yeah. right. They shouldn't get funded. There's a reason, exactly. Right. <laughs> and there's a, there's a bit of a, a shift of... Uh, you know, oftentimes that budget gets rolled into other things at the mission level, often which have an IT component, and, and so right. there is some of that that happens. Yeah. Uh, many agencies, it's not implemented by the central IT function. It's actually implemented by kind of a mission function, and we hope to correct that as well because we think there should be coordination. I think this is where dovetailing VMO and IR investment review boards really comes into play, where IRBs need to have this holistic strategic view across what's being spent and then... So just a curiosity question. When you had the CIO summit, were the three agencies that have been piloting this like missionaries, and or did everybody sit around the table thinking, wow, those three guys are crazy? <laughs> <laughs> we generally think Roger's crazy. <laughs> you want to speak to that? Um, I mean, if, if I say what I'm thinking, it's going to sound a little egotistical, but I think if you look at Casey and, at, and at John and what we're doing at VA, I think it's viewed as a bit of leadership. I'll speak directly to what Casey's doing with cloud stuff. Um, that is clearly a leadership piece in the government, you know, in moving out and taking all of GSA to cloud, email, and desktop. We're all asking ourselves, how do we do the same thing? Um, so there may be a little bit of thought that we're a little bit crazy, but not a lot. <laughs> Okay. I'm crazy, so I want to pivot to the other topic. Yeah. Uh, actually, just really quick, the one comment I would make that you want to think about, in case you touched on it, the notion of uh, looking at your inventory, is spend under management. So what is the total spend that is under the management of the VMO? Because the metric that you'll find is, initially, it'll be a very small percentage, and your goal should be to make that as high as possible. So what is the spend under management? That's a great, great metric. Mm -hmm. And I think portfolio saddle could start to give us a view into what kind of the total, the, the denominator is at least to some degree. Exactly. So we can start driving towards that. Great. So we'll, we'll shift to uh, uh, IT portfolio management investment review boards with uh, David from, uh, from uh, Interior. Thank you, Steve. Um, we had terrific site visits to many of your companies. We went to uh, Aetna, um, to uh, Enrique Symantec, uh, saw Liz down at uh, beautiful offices in Tampa, and also went to Adobe. Um, and I should I want to make a couple of broad comments on page one and then ask Andrew to talk a little bit about the big takeaway. Um, the smaller takeaways, uh, we had an incremental, uh, very important incremental development uh, in the last couple of years. I've talked a little bit about this uh, with all of you before. We're a highly siloed department. We have eight or ten major units, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, our offshore oil and gas. We've got uh, USGS. We've got the Bureau of Reclamation. Many of these are very important businesses. We manage one-third of the energy production in the United States. We manage our one, almost one-third of our land mass. Uh, these are big organizations, 100,000, I'm sorry, 10,000 plus people, each a billion, several billion dollar budgets each. They have all had their own separate IT systems. They all have their own separate ways of doing things. What we, what we learned uh, with great help from all of you is that's not an efficient way to do business. And we've been on an IT transformation effort now for a couple of years. We realize we need a central uh, single authority for decision making. Um, so we, we've been going in steps. We, we, we no longer have bureau CIOs. Uh, we now have a centralized CIO. We have essentially downgraded what the bureau, former bureau CIOs should do. They're not going to, they should not be learning all about the hardware and the, and the big backbone software. They should be much more of a service oriented, uh, below the kind of big picture. They're the ones, the customer service to make sure, and so it's a completely different culture change we're trying to do. Um, 
We also learned, and, and Liz was a terrific uh, teacher in this, to be ruthless about requiring uh, ruthless is the right word, Liz. <laughs> to be, to be, to, 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 to have department-wide um, structures to enable at the top us to give hard messages to folks asking about whether proposed big spends really met an important business function. I only say ruthless because we, we sat for several hours and watched Liz do this work with her top management team. The ruthless part was there was one, uh, I recall, one uh, piece of software, a major thing, and the, the owner of it was actually not in the building that day. Um, uh, and and uh, they Bad lost out. That was, yeah. Yeah. that was a Bad mistake. Luck. Bad day to miss. <laughs> um, so uh, there's there's a lot of of, of um, uh, items here to talk about our governance structure and everything else. But in the very few minutes we have, I really want to go to two, page two and tell you what we're doing. Twenty five. Uh, uh, because uh, it's the second bullet. We're transforming from a federated IT service delivery model into a new single-wide DOI IT service delivery organization. We've decided to do this by ripping off the Band-Aid. Within the last several weeks, we have had meetings with every one of our bureau directors, and we, uh, with Andrew's leadership, he's going to explain uh, very briefly here that what, what we're looking to centralize and what we're looking to keep in the bureaus, because they need some mission-specific software and some capability still at the bureau level. But there's a lot of redundancy at the major level. I talked last time about we have one server for every seven employees at our department, for example. Um, and what we're doing is we're identifying the literally thousands of people that work on bat backbone systems in our bureaus. We are moving them to report to our CIO and then to Andrew, our Deputy Assistant Secretary. We're having very difficult discussions, looking at every IT person and finding out what they're doing and deciding whether they stay in the Bureau or the, whether they go to the new central organization. The new central organization is going to have eight major activities. We're re recruiting the best of the best for each of these. We're finding a new career paths for our IT people so the, they don't end up as the best IT person in the National Park Service. They end up as the best IT person in a huge organization. Uh, Andrew, why don't you talk a little bit about how we're trying to to distinguish the, the centralization versus the, the bureau-specific activity. Sure, we, we spent a lot of time really trying to make strategic choices about what would be uh, what would best benefit from coming into a central organization. And where we kind of drew that line was the mission applications that David was talking about, where uh, we feel that there is a really strong connection for the most part in terms of how the mission is delivered and the systems that are used to deliver that system. What we're doing is we're moving the investment management pieces into the department so we actually can see what's going on inside each of the portfolios. And we're managing that now much more closely than we ever have at a departmental level. But everything else, all of the other operations, essentially the backbone pieces, the network, the, uh, the data centers, of which we have uh, more than we should, um, the number of servers, the virtualization of the servers, all of that is actually coming into the department. And we'll be delivering that as a, a new service catalog-based, unit-based pricing model. Um, so we're pretty excited about um, you know this this uh, this pretty fundamental shift in what we're doing, and we think that by by asserting you know a, a fair amount of control over those things that were most redundant in the department, and still respecting the need to have a certain amount of sort of ownership of the the pieces that are most closely tied to missions, we've been able to draw I think a pretty a pretty good distinction, um, and it's it's resonated well with uh, within a lot of corners of our department. So wish us luck with that. Um, <laughs> Huge move. Uh, we are, we're, we're going to keep these folks in place. Uh, they're, they're not going to physically move yet. They're, they're, they're just going to be paid by a different entity and have a different reporting mechanism. We are confident that it's going to result in a very significant uh, reduction uh, in the number of employees at our department who are doing IT. That's creating a lot of, of anxiety in our department. Uh, but this needs to be done. Yeah, huge. Change management in this process is going to be incredibly important. Yeah. And you're going to find there's certain people who probably can't play well in your new structure. Right. And you need to figure out what to do. Good for you. That's great. So I, uh, I hope Andrew and I will be here. Callous <laughs> 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 The next time we're I mean, on the bold action. I know. These things don't change without a pivot, so 
Good for you. That's great. We have a very engaged secretary, like Ken Salazar, and, yeah. and we are we're driving it. And I hope it works. But I think it will. I think it will. I mean, everyone can see it. And, and Andrew, what Andrew and Bernie Mazur bring is the idea that everyone's going to get better service. This is not, this is, this is going to make everyone's life easier. What Andrew, I'm getting a Mac on my, on my desk uh, because of Andrew. And, and we're going to have a better opportunity for different choices for all employees. We're going to, uh, and, and then that's part of the message is we're going to actually very much improve your service. Uh, if we do it this way. This isn't a centralization that's going to be more of a bureaucracy. This is all about good service, and that's that's sort of the, the ethos of what we're trying to, uh, uh, yeah, so. Education. Okay, my, my, so Dan Harris is there. Let me, uh, I think it's important to, to set a little bit of a context. Danny, come uh, up to the table. Please. Uh, so he, here's the context of education. Uh, five years ago, um, as part of a, uh, uh, the administration's move to outsourcing greater efficiency in government, um, uh, there was a set of decisions made to take all of Ed's IT infrastructure, so desktops, laptops, servers, all the assets, in terms of all the services, and completely put that out and have it managed. And so we don't have kind of control over that, over a, a multi-year contract, um, frankly, with a vendor that had never done work in federal s space. Um, and we had no experience doing that. We did that with not documentation of the assets, and we put in place, or did not put in place clear service level agreements. Um, it was without the support of really the career kind of team, right, within the, our IT organization. And it was done at, at that time, it was five years ago, relatively late stage in kind of the second term of the administration. And so you had then significant leadership turnover within 18 months. Other than that, it was a great decision. <laughs> um, uh, not surprising what has happened. Um, you know, when we came in, um, and it was, frankly, we had a mess, right? You had costs, right, that were not meeting the cost projections, and surprises where you're getting, you know, new bills coming in in terms of, well, these was the assets we didn't think you had, and so this is how the pricing on the contract worked. You had service levels that were just decaying, and so you had real frustration. And you had a perceived lack of responsiveness because you call our IT shop and say, hey, we need you to fix this. And it's like, we don't own the asset or the service. And so, and we didn't really have the infrastructure. And so that's what we've been digging out of over the last five years. Um, I think that's important because you know, a lot of the work has been on putting service level agreements in place and trying to manage the cost, get a sense of the cost. But it's also important because in terms of our IT organization, it does not have the credibility kind of amongst the leadership. It's one of the, you guys are just a pain, right, and just a problem. And so this whole notion of you're going to move into vendor man, uh, portfolio management in terms of business value, our, our leadership, right, broadly defined would say, are you kidding me? IT being a, a value added piece of our business is just not, it's just not credible right now. Now I say all that because fast forward to where we are today. We've actually done a lot of work of kind of cleaning up, and we're now positioning, not just so we're getting much more predictable cost and improved service, that you know, the, the legacy perception notwithstanding, actual performance is much, much better. Second of all, in parallel, we put in place, kind of we had put in place some basic, uh, and even, even the second wave of, of portfolio management. And so we actually have segment owners that reviews the portfolio. And so we're not bad in terms of the technical capability that Danny's put in place, where you know, those come, they're reviewed um, with, the, with the group that I sit on to really start making some trade-off decisions. And in an environment where budgets are constrained, it's kind of easier when you start cutting, call, cutting budgets, it's easier to say what floats to the top. And so our big takeaways from the visit was how do we actually now go to the, this next level of really getting like business value? And what we've said is, and realized is, to, if we're going to do that, we really are going to have to come up with <coughs> really engaging our business, our line of segment leaders, uh, to really understand and, and rethink, have them reframe how they think about IT. And that's very difficult in an environment where not only you don't have credibility, but you know, the IT value add can be somewhat amorphous in some of the services that are being provided in the federal government. So you can't link to you know, new customer acquisition or you know, operating cost reduction where it's personnel where you can redirect it. And so that's been the, a, the big takeaway. If that's what we want to do, the takeaways from the site visits have been, if you really don't have buy-off on the top, it's going to be really hard to get the alignment. Two, what we're finding is 
what we really have to have is some levers. And so if you have a whole part of your spin that you cannot manipulate and or you're tied to leg, it's, it's hard then to kind of prioritize things in a new way and have people see the effect of that. And so we said, okay, we've got to create some space here if we're really going to have people see it. Uh, and then, you know, obviously it's kind of, how do you actually not only provide the alignment, but then the ongoing transparency. So, so th those were some of the takeaways. And so what you're going to see here in terms of what we're doing in, it's, it's, and for those of you who know me, it's, it's a little bit ironic because it's a little bit on the softer side, right? <laughs> because it's, uh, it's not about what's the bottom line, how many, because I mean, we, we actually took you know, millions of dollars out this, yet this fiscal year, but we kind of would have done that anyway, right? Just because you have to. And so the, what the real challenge has been is, Danny has been, with our sponsorship, having kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of our senior most leaders in each of the business units to help them articulate what their real issues are, and then how do they think about value. We're also developing a new value um, methodology. And so it's a, it's a framework for the first time that says, how do we think about these in terms of business value, not just kind of techno technological value and a cost? And so that's been something that's kind of a, a 1.0. Um, and then our, what our plan is, is actually kind of take this in the context of a new IT strategy. And so that's also been new because it's been not just it's been an IT strategy in terms of what we want to do in terms of rebid the contract. There's a set of things that would be kind of in the world of the OCIO, and instead recast that in, the, in terms of the agency strategy. Now, how, how is IT a real initiative? So it's almost been a recrafting. That's what we've been kind of working in parallel on, moving towards now in this quarter. We're now trying to go live, if you will, with syndication of the IT strategy in the context. Here's the implications for our value. Um, um, our portfolio management and, and our value methodology that we're going to be using in that. And then to actually, frankly, we're really trying to apply it towards the next fiscal year, given where we are with our planning cycles. You have to use that, to use it that way to kind of influence kind of what projects you would or wouldn't do, and then do a retrospective for the fiscal year that we, that we can influence, it, but only at the margin. That's what we're trying to do. And our real goal is to really come up with like a baseline. Because the whole challenge here is, well, what, what would it have been and how do you do it differently? So you get a real baseline for like a look back and then say, okay, that's the baseline. How do we then kind of have continuous improvement against that baseline for the 14 year? So that's the approach we're taking. Um, again, it's a little bit again, softer because I think the challenge we have at this stage in our term is, you know, the organization's like, hey, you're, you know, November's going to be election. <laughs> You know, how are we going to get this to sustain? So that's why I think it's really been, you know, Danny and our CIO's leadership, right, and trying to move not just to the political leadership for each of the, the, if you will, the lines of business, but also to try to build a methodology that can sustain through the underlying process. So that's where we are at Edgeport. So this, uh, there's other highlights across government where uh, this, this process is really some nice fruit. Um, uh, Department of Agriculture, Move from 21 email systems to one. It's a third the cost. They move from over a thousand mobile contracts to three inside the entire agency. It was a big bulls move. Uh, Department of Commerce consolidated all their uh, PC buying into one. Uh, over 15 percent discount across the board on that. Um, and then we're also it's this. It's funny that this you know once you centralize and kind of to Danny's point or Tony's point get. IT is more of a strategic asset, kind of in that conversation, other things start to happen. And so we're, we're putting out guidance on how to change the way mission software is built in a more modular way and start to cascade this stuff into cross-sharing uh, uh, within these departments, both on the kind of commodity side and, and on the way we deploy technology. And so we're, we're excited about, uh, about all that. Um, the, the questions, again, are very cultural. You know, as we scale this out across government, you know, as you mentioned, wisely change is hard. Uh, I think the second half of question number two there is, is the one I'd like to lead off with, which is, you know, that, that partnership that exists between the business owner and kind of the IT function or the CIO, um, rather than sort of a service provider, how do you make that a strategic relationship? And, um, you know, mandate from the top in Tony's case, but there's other ways, I'm sure, and I'd love to hear about ways you've done that. Back to the earlier discussion that we had and Ron's comments about goals, uh, to the extent that you uh, incorporate into individual goals of the business unit leaders uh, the IT transformation process, and it also goes to Tony's points about making this a strategic imperative of the organization. It's a business need. They're part of it. Their goals are aligned with that of the CIO. 
um, and the performance uh, reviews and discussions that Ron was talking about uh, as it pertains to their individual goals are integrated. And so the, the two of them are really aligned as business partners achieving that goal as opposed to that vendor relationship, the person you call when your computer isn't working. Uh, I think that's really a critical change uh, part of the process, thinking of the of the IT function as a business partner and aligning their goals with the business goals and aligning the business goals with the IT transformation. Uh, that's a, a great leverage point, the, the, the individual goals. Yeah, I mean, I think that's critical, and I think we've talked a lot about legally to having, you know, that notion of one person that's accountable. We actually, you know, it works against you in this situation. We actually moved to, and you, and you know, we, we should talk to you guys both about it. There's two signatures on everything. There has to be a business leader mm -hmm. and an IT leader. So mm -hmm. every project, every spend, everything has two signatures. So right there, you have, you know, <laughs> we've been using the Nexus squeeze. The, the, you're, you're united in this goal. So yeah, you got to put it in the goals, but on a project by project basis. It has to be two people in tandem whose outcomes are tied to each other, not one and subordinate to yeah, one the, another. The, the question you want to ask, and we talked a little bit about this, is do, does everybody who works in the department see technology as part of a transformation, or do they see us as running back office systems? Because, see, there's a mind shift that has to happen where it's about really driving a transformational change in fundamental customer service and productivity. If you can't get that mind shift, we're just relegated to doing back office ERP systems or whatever, and that, that doesn't get the value. And so it has to start at the very top where people are saying, we will transform through technology. And here's the benefits to you, as David was saying. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, whether you can't see it yourself, here's the end benefit from you from having a different lens on how you think about technology and partnership. By the secretary or the deputy secretary as one of the two or three strategic imperatives for the organization for this year that's going to be reflected in both the department goals and the individual goals, and that's then part of the business leadership and the, both the business unit leaders and the CIO, and they're all aligned around that. Then it becomes a strategic element of the organization's mission as opposed to the back office. And on this single point of accountability, the uh, neck to squeeze thing, which I'm a big, big advocate of, I think Liz makes a good point. If, if it's seen as that's IT's problem, that's their issue, they need to deal with it, then yes, they have a lot of accountability, but they don't have the actual ability to achieve anything. That's why it has to be, I think, integrated and identified at the very top. This is a, which it sounds, David, like it's a big deal yeah. in your department this year. This is one of the two or three things we're going to do when everybody's on board and it's in everybody's goals. That, that I think seeing the, IT as a strategic asset is probably our biggest sorry? challenge. That, yeah. the, the ability to see IT as a strategic asset is probably yeah. our biggest challenge. Yeah. Largely I, I, working with Congress, you know, we have a lot of people that sort of view IT as their ability to check their BlackBerry and print right. um, and not not really get into a lot of things there. But we're starting to see the tide change, too, I think. Well, it's, it's a need need for more, for, and this loops back to the development and training issue, which is giving people a broader context to understand technology as part of competitive strategy mm -hmm. and part of the fundamental exactly. success of the business. And so uh, early on in our process, we actually invested substantially in training for the senior executives, not in, the, not in the infrastructure and technology, but to really educate them on how technology is part of the business strategy. And so I think building on Enrique's comments, I think, I think that kind of fundamental training and orientation is absolutely critical. We actually said that there were no IT projects, there were only business projects. Right. And, and that's really what you have to do, and that leads back to this joint signature. It's about, here's the business need, here's how the technology is helping the business accomplish its overall objective. There's an interesting chicken and egg here, because Jeff, you had a slide about 18 months ago of the productivity gap. Right. Um, and viewing that productivity gap, you know, then you talk about IT is viewed as a cost, not a competitive weapon. In, in the federal government. So if it's not what's transforming the government, then it's something that should be reduced and spent. Right. If it's something that is causes, that's closing that productivity gap, then it should be invested in. Right. And, and our problem right now is that, by and large, IT is viewed across federal government as a cost that should be reduced yeah. instead of an investment that returns results that justifies an increase. But, but if you can connect it, Roger, and you know maybe the Patent Office would be a good example of this, if you can connect it to customer satisfaction, to better results, better outcomes, and people can actually see 
the strategic benefits as opposed to the cost benefits. And certainly in, in the VA, you know, connected to improved uh, patient care, improved performance of the physicians, improved uh, performance of the hospitals, which we all know it achieves, and really connected to the missions of, of the physicians and the providers in the hospitals, then they understand this is not just a back office function or a cost center. This is an enabler to achieving my goals. And again, to me, it's a, it's a virtual cir uh, circle connecting it to their strategic objectives of the year so they understand it helps them achieve what they're trying to accomplish substantively. I think it's important to acknowledge, though, a very real challenge that you have that we have in business, which is while you're getting these technology systems in place that'll take all this cost out, it's a cost add on top of a legacy system expense base. So you have what we call the boa constrictor moment, okay? Where you have to <laughs> invest forward to get out of this mess while you're still weaning yourself off the legacy systems and you have this dual cost component at a moment in time. And that has to be acknowledged. And one of the challenges I think you have even more is that if, if in business, if we can paint the picture that four and five years down the line, wow, the savings will be this much, we as leaders can sell the expansion to contraction. The way that you guys pragmatically are operating, it's very difficult for you to sell in that annual this to, so you never really get that switch off of legacy systems. I, I just, it's an important distinction between how I've come to understand you operate and what we have the capability of doing. And I think the, the other thing which is I'm finding which is, you, we're still trying to drive change management on the basic business transformation. And so, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not as if there's an agreed upon and everybody's on board that I'm going to increase overall productivity against these service level metrics over the next by 20%, of which then IT is an enabler. You're almost saying, I'm trying to build buy-in that we're going to get the top line strategy business transformation, one, and then two, IT is the real enabler to do that. It's like, it's a double sell, is what I'm finding in some areas of our operation. Well, I'll give, I'll give the, yeah. the flip side, if you don't mind, the, the flip side of Tony's argument is, um, since our board of directors has 535 members, and making the pitch you're describing, Liz, is exactly right. They don't want to know about savings five years down the line. They want to know about it tomorrow because that's what, they, that's what their constituents are looking at. They're very excited about things that directly relate to a policy outcome or directly relate to a specific programmatic outcome. But a shift to cloud email, which will give me a $15 million a year in savings, and that's why we're doing it, following the GSA model, which is an excellent model, by the way. Um, they don't want to hear about that, because that has no, it has no measurable programmatic impact. It will have a tremendous productivity impact inside my organization, but the sales pitch for the initial investment is a very difficult pitch for us to make. And by the way, it's brilliantly designed, our budget system is brilliantly designed so that you're projecting your budget proposal is for a year and a half down the line. That means your IT buy is another year down the line. Add in protest time. You're talking about change that's <laughs> three, four, five years down the line. Wow. You know, it's, I'm, I may or may not be here in five years. So. John. So is it an act of Congress to change the way the budget construction works? <laughs> I mean, literally. I mean, yeah, it's, it's 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 yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, is it law? Sometimes these things are laws. Yeah. One chore. We're actually working it with Congress on capital yeah. budgeting and multi-year funding for IT as a, as a suggestion, connect, and that will take an act of Congress. Yes. To so, so, John, so connecting John, two oh. dots, if, if Roger's issue, which is when I save it, what do I get for it, and the bow constrictor analogy that Liz used, is there a way to you know, do vendor management to get a pool headroom. of funding, yeah, headroom, headroom. to headroom. fund your bubble and That's have a smooth-looking budget? And then the other part of that is just maniacally going after all this duplication. Well, that's exactly all this stuff the that freezing the waste. legacy yeah. systems will get you a big portion. Not you know you can right. you can't use the boa constrictor if we can yeah. never get this done. You gotta you gotta ruthlessly cut out the all the right. other stuff and you'll get your headspace that's that what, way. And, and I, I have to thank Liz for that one. That's what we have. We're doing that. We are we have sort of an across the board. We're not investing in legacy system. The other benefit of that gave gave us some money for our transformation, but it also forced people to talk to us because now they've got an issue. 
uh, and 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 they they need service. And how are they going to get service? And and that's had a that's actually had a very beneficial. So effect. we've got to wrap. So John for a minute, Kathleen for a minute, and then Steve just bring this all together and, and how we're going to hardwire it. I'm just going to go back. Liz used the concept of pivot before, and it, and. Uh, I think the direction and obviously the consolidation where we're going with each one of us uh, in, in this direction is, is great. It will still produce 46, there are 46 different agencies in the federal government, which means we could still have 46 different contracts. And it seems to me the pivot has got to be, you know, why are we all buying different accounting systems? You know, it's one government, it's got to roll up to one financial sheet, and yet every one of us goes out and repeats the same mistakes and buys a different IT system and has to go through both an IT and a vendor management unit. And, and yet, even if I consolidate OPM or David consolidates Interior, we have different accounting systems. And so the pivot, it seems to me, where we've got to get to is to start to say, okay, at what point do we start to say government-wide using your market power and make some of these decisions more you know, universally rather than agency by agency, 46 different units at a time. Amen. That would be the ultimate win. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, you got to take the elephant no, down one by yeah. at a time. <laughs> well, and, uh, <laughs> I have I've actually contemplated this a lot. I think, I think it, you know, we're big enough at 80 billion in, in, in kind of the commodity spend plus who knows how much more on the emission side that in there's actually a benefit in the diversity of our spend to American business. And so I think there is a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a balance we have to strike there. So, so Mark, this day in history, I'm going to defend Congress here. Um, <laughs> I actually um, came from my, my appropriations hearing yesterday. We spent a lot of time talking about IT, about going to the cloud, about data center consolidate. We, we have spent a lot of time at the Department of Agriculture basically marketing our administrative efficiencies. I mean, we've got a blueprint for stronger service. It's got a nice motif. We've got result stocks. We've got talking points. And we just keep drill, drill, drill. And the, um, and the Congress people are starting to put it, you see it in their talking points, in their rhetoric, both sides of the aisle. So I think sometimes we get very focused on selling our policies. And we don't do as much of a heavy lift in selling our management side. And I think that it can be done. That's that's the experience that I'm seeing in agriculture with our with our congressional members. Great. You wrap up session as to how this is going to move forward. Great. So thank you all again for all the advice. As you can see, we've done a lot here. Uh, we're excited to get portfolio stat out to kind of keep the momentum going in a very programmatic way that we have the convening power in OMB to do. And uh, and so I think this is going to have a nice, uh, nice set of results ahead. And hopefully we're all sitting around someday in the future celebrating additional uh, savings and, and other things. So it's fabulous you. progress. I well feel done. like I should be <laughs> About 25 past the smaller group of PMAB members. Let's reconvene here in 10 minutes, and I think we can be finished by 12:15 or so. Good. Thank you, everybody.